Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Beyond Train Podcast. I'm your host, Leo Dalton. Listen, if you're new around here, why don't you give the show a little follow and maybe a subscribe if you're on YouTube. And if you like the show, give us a review, comment. As always, sharing is the best way to help support the show, get the word out there, and and really share the the message that that we're trying to that we're trying to explore here. So really appreciate all that, guys. Uh, today we're gonna have a great episode. We have uh, Brian Sanders on. Um, this man has has some really cool Instagram pages. Does some really interesting work. Has some really cool businesses that I want to talk a little bit about. Um, to me, he seems like a really solution minded person, and I think that's really important in today's day and age. I think all too it's all too easy to kind of focus on um, all the problems that are happening, and there's a time and a place for that, of course. But um, moving towards solutions is is very important. So, uh, really appreciate uh, you coming on today, Brian. Thanks for joining us. Absolutely, good to be here. Right on. So, I ask all my guests an introductory question. I ask them to define health. What health is? What it means? What it looks like? You can take it any direction you'd like. Oh man, yeah, I think. Health is is thriving and not surviving, and it's more than the absence of disease. I've seen some definitions of health. It's the absence of disease, which is really sad. That that's what it's come to these days, is people just think that that's kind of good enough. And I think there's way too many people out there just surviving, right? And not enough people thriving. And it's I don't think we even know what it means to thrive anymore as humans because we've come a long way since our ancestors and we'll probably get into a lot of that stuff. I'm, I'm into this idea of ancestral health and that we, we were healthier in the past. And there's this idea that we, we weren't, there was, you know, a hard life and we were uh, just barely surviving. And uh, I don't believe that's true at all. I know a lot of good paleoanthropologists and doctors that study this stuff and, we were we were doing really well. We were super smart. I always like to think of humans as how, how well know how smart we are now. We have iPhones and rocket ships and amazing stuff. Hundreds of thousands of years ago, we were just as smart. But instead of knowing how to create an iPhone, we know how to hunt and live and acquire food and detoxify food and take apart animals and track them and navigate from the stars. And, you know, we weren't any less intelligent. I'm telling you, we had the same brains and we use them in different ways. Right. And it's so cool to think um, how we were just thriving back then and how we could use that knowledge in different ways. And we've lost a lot of that and we've lost a lot of what it is to be human really. And so, yeah, I'm on, I'm on a journey to the broader journey is to get more to our human roots. Uh, yeah, well put, I mean, like, I think we probably, uh, align there quite a lot. Um, I'm really interested in that, the ancestral way of life. And, you know, you bring up a good point that, um, a lot of this is lost. Like the modern man simply wouldn't be able to survive in a primitive setting uh, for the most part, obviously. Uh, most most people wouldn't be able to survive. They wouldn't be able to track. They wouldn't be able to hunt. Uh, they wouldn't be able to prepare food um, or keep food or build shelter, stuff like that. The other funny thing is that even in the modern world, yeah, we have iPhones and we have uh, laptops and stuff like that. And <laughs> it's really easy to sit there and use an iPhone and use a laptop. But think about like just something that popped in my mind is, most people can't build an iPhone or build a computer, right? Like, you no know what one, I mean? Yeah. Like this is, and it speaks to the, you know, I think to our ability to work together, right? Because even like to build these technologies, there's many steps involved. So, but again, like to have a successful thriving community, it takes a lot of working together, right? It takes a strong community, it takes a strong bond, um, in a slightly different way, maybe than what we have, because even though we're hyper social, we're hyper connected, you know, we're not, a lot of people are depressed and feel lonely, right? It's a very interesting dynamic that we are more connected than ever, but, you know, and have access to any food that you want at any time, but still we're more unhealthy than ever. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I think about this stuff a lot and, and yeah, community and the people around us are, are so important. And 
there there's a blue zones that I like to debunk, but one of the great things they do have is that community and, and people around you and how, and they realize how important that is. And there's also an idea of people think it's kind of dumb to do the, the ancestral thing. They're like, Oh, you guys want to run around in loincloths and live in caves. And I'm like, no, not at all. So well, partly. I, I, uh, what's that? Partly. <laughs> partly. Well, a little bit, a little bit. It's just, I mean, I want to be, I want to have time outdoors. I want to be around the bonfire. I, but no, I still live in the city. I'm here in Austin. I, you know, I live near downtown, but I don't, I can still live in a more human way. That doesn't mean I'm living in a cave, but that means I'm going to a farmer's market and talking to the people that raise the cows and the eggs and getting meat from them. Right. So it's like, I, I'm so far away from living in a cave and doing all that stuff yet. I can still have the the human experiences and, and live better and not just be like someone who over, o- orders Uber Eats and and plays video games. It's like, I just came from beach volleyball, actually. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, I'm out there doing stuff outdoors while living in the city. So that's what I mean with this ancestral health stuff. I Because sometimes some people are into it, right? And they're great. But then maybe 80% of people out there or people listening, they might be man, these guys are, you know, just some caveman, you know, it just doesn't sound that, that great or that appropriate in modern society. So I'm, yeah, we're trying to navigate that to live, live in the modern world, yet not succumb to the modern tragedies that diseases, all that stuff that most people do. Yeah. Common, common thing that we talk about here, kind of like the integration of natural principles into a more modern lifestyle, right? Like, um, I mean, look at what we're doing right now, right? You're in Austin, I'm up in Nova Scotia and we're having a conversation. Um, you know, it's, it certainly doesn't fall into the category of ancestral living. (laughs) Uh, but at the same time, you know, we can take the, the good from this, um, you know, hopefully, sharing a good decent message and and trying to get the word out there in that respect um you know using these these modern technologies for the good right and mm-hmm. not getting trapped by an algorithm or you know consumed by it right like we're not we're not even engaging in overconsumption either right like having the balance with it they're tools right they're tools uh and you don't want to you don't want to abuse them Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that's a really interesting point. We we keep coming back to that, right? It's the integration of of ancestral principles, if you will, into mm-hmm. our our lives. Yeah, yeah, that's great, man. Um, maybe we could dig in uh, a little bit into how you came to this conclusion that you know the ancestral way of life is almost like a healthier way of life, right? Um, you know, for me, it was a lot through Weston A. Price. Um, you know, even talking to the local native here a lot of them like to to talk about their ancestral way of life right um western air price was big talking to people in the community uh, the health community that are kind of in a similar mindset but curious to hear how you kind of came to this conclusion and also you know what what were those big pieces of evidence that that really hit at home for you yeah i never thought i would be here i started as a mechanical engineer and i, I grew up in hawaii i was just good at math and science. I just thought, oh, I'd be a mechanical engineer. Went to college, got a degree from UCLA. It's amazing. Did some cool stuff, got into tech later, right? I had this whole career and then I found myself at 30 with a dad bod and having, you know, multiple medical problems starting to pop up and having lost both my parents. Yeah. So they, they both, uh, my mom, Start, was pretty severe into Alzheimer's by then. And I lost my dad from cancer. And so that woke me up. Yeah. And I, I found, uh, well, I actually found Mark Sisson's book. My friends found it first. They, they lost a lot of weight by, and got way healthier just by following the, the primal blueprint, right? That hit Mark Sisson's book was called the primal blueprint. I read it and it made sense and my life was forever changed. And so, yeah, it, it just really is simple when, you know, it's presented correctly. And, but then I, I, I did my own research, started listening to tons of podcasts, reading other books, going to conferences, all this other stuff and learned more and more and c- kind of got 
into a bit of a, a camp, like a dietary camp. And it was like kind of this low carb world. And, you know, there's keto and there's all this stuff. This was maybe more like seven years ago. And then, so part of my journey was realizing that you can't get stuck into one way of thinking and you have to look at everything. I didn't want to be wrong as another thing, right? And then there's this engineering approach of like root cause, root uh, first principles, right? All this stuff, systems thinking, all these things of let's not just listen to, to what we're told by the government or let's not just fall into one way of thinking because again, you don't want to be wrong. Like if you just have one way of thinking, if you just have one way of viewing the world that we have to go low carb to be healthy and to lose weight, and then that means and carbs are the enemy, then you're you're proven wrong really easily when there's entire populations <laughs> that are eating carbs and are fine, or there's a huge times in history of people eating fruit and whatever, potatoes and rice, and they were fine. Or bodybuilders, for example, these guys are shredded and they're crushing carbs and rice and whatnot, right? Before, like to cut down, they're they're going maybe low fat and low carb at the same time, or or they're just you're going eating a bunch of carbs and protein, super high protein and really low fat, and they're getting shredded. And so, yeah, I, I, I coined this thing camp, no camp, uh, which is kind of funny because it's a little oxymoronic because now I am in a camp. <laughs> the camp is the no camp camp, but that's kind of part of the fun. Uh, but uh, camp, no camp, it's where, yeah, you, you don't buy into any one ideology and you're always open to learning new things and trying not to be wrong. I want to be the least wrong. And so if I'm thinking that, that carbs are the enemy, then I'm going to be wrong a lot and the world's not going to make much sense. And if I think that like plant-based diets are terrible, then I'm going to be wrong too, because there's some people that can do some sort of plant-based version, not hundred percent plant-based. I don't, I don't think that's good for anyone. We're not, we know we're not gorillas. We're not cows. We have different digestive systems. We're not meant to be plant-based completely, but if you're doing some sort of pescatarian diet or you're including some good dairy and you're eating eggs and you're having some oysters and fish, great. I mean, that's fine. Maybe maybe your plate looks super plant-based, but you can do some version of that and it actually could be a nutrient-dense, complete nutrition, you know, complete bioavailable protein and nutrients. If you're including, you know, the seafood and the dairy, okay, good for you. You know, and there's all these other people on the internet that are yelling like, this is terrible and like you have to eat red meat and like this and that. Like, no, you don't have to do anything. You just need to have, your body doesn't care the name of your diet. Your body cares about protein and vitamins, and minerals, and, and then energy to get through the day that can come from fat or carb. And as long as you're getting the right amounts of those and the correct ratios and in the correct forms and in their whole form, which we can get into too, right? It's like the difference between whole foods and processed foods really plays a role in this and, and then how you're going to regulate uh, your appetite and how you're going to not become overweight. And it's this like slow, gradual process that you don't really even realize is happening, right? It's like no one becomes overweight and sick in a month or even a year. It's really years and years. So there's a, yeah, there's a lot that plays into this. And so you can't be dogmatic about it. And, uh, yeah, that's generally the the high level stuff that I I've been on this journey for 10 years now, 7 years full time and I've learned a lot. Amazing. Yeah, I I, I completely agree with that approach and I I was going to bring up the whole red meat thing too. Like you don't have to eat cows or big game to eat an ancestral diet either. That's something I learned from, you know, Dr. Price's research. You know, when he looked at the tribes around the world, some of them were just eating rodents. The Aborigines down in Australia, they were just eating rodents, right? And they were in perfect health. Some of them ate primarily fish. Well, and I mean rodents and, you know, different plants yeah. and stuff like that too, right? But um, like they they weren't hunting big game. Like maybe, you know, um, like they were the natives here in mm -hmm. like Eastern Canada. They probably ate a lot of moose and bear and stuff. And they ate a lot of fish. They ate a lot of salmon here. That was a big one. 
Um, I know like I learned a lot from the uh, Nishinaabe people like from Toronto area. Uh, one of my old mentors there, you know, he was saying how like his ancestral diet would have been 90% salmon. Hmm. You know, they just ate salmon. It was in such abundance. It was easy. You could reach into the river, boom, grab a salmon just like that. <laughs> It's kind of funny like you know it's just it's mm. there are many different ways to approach this and i think when you look at nature that's one of the things that you learn is holism right you learn that there is and it teaches you to avoid dogmatic ways of thinking as well right because there's so many different ways of life um that all can be cohesive and and kind of mm. in aligned with natural principles in a way right cool. so Humans are the most diverse species on earth. We can live anywhere. And yes. we and we just are super smart, like I was saying, and we can look at our environment and get good nutrition no matter what it is, no matter what the environment is. By the equator, it's going to be different from up north. And we can make you can make a nutrient dense diet that's super complete and and ideal for humans no matter where you are on the earth. Well, until I love Weston Price. I I have a podcast myself called Peak Human. I've about 220 episodes and I probably brought up Weston Price on 170 of them. <laughs> it was kind of my joke. It's like, can I bring it up in every podcast? Him up. But uh, love everything about it. And I'm working on episode two of my Food Lies documentary series. And we have a whole section on Weston Price and some of the other explorers that came after him and that found the same things. So yeah, it's it's a great way to to kind of like yeah verify modern science, more ancient you know paleoanthropologic research, and you know Western price and everything lines up, you know like when you if you're vegan, it's things aren't going to make much sense because you're 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 not going to come you're going to be wrong a lot like I was saying before, and if you have this more ancestral approach and a more open minded approach that's not dogmatic everything falls into place. Everything makes sense. It's like the theory of everything. Everything's right with the world. So obviously the, the food lies is a big page, gained a lot of traction, really impressive. Uh, I'm really interested in kind of the, maybe if you just want to give like a little couple minute presentation on like what, have you learned in pursuing that specifically, right? Looking at the food industry itself and the problems therein, you know, like um, the way that it's structured, the way that we get our food, you know, kind of maybe just give us a little rundown on it. Yeah. I fell into social media to start off with the actual Food Lies uh, account just because I was making this docuseries and I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't have a monet monetization plan and I didn't have anything going for me. So I started the podcast, started the social media and it just grew into a movement. And so, yeah, people can follow me on, on Instagram is mainly where I post at food.lies, but it's huge learning experience of putting information out in the public. And it's, it's like I'm kind of making the docuseries along with the world and getting live feedback, right? And and it's really cool doing it along the way. And, and then I can see what resonates with people, you know, and then I, or I learn from other people on social media or really I, I've interviewed over 300 people now for the series or for my podcast or just in general. And so that that's part of my goal is, you know, like I'm not going to just go down one path and just think I'm right. It's like, how many people can I interview? And, and I think my role is the communicator in all this, you know, so even people listening, why am I listening to this guy? He doesn't have a nutrition degree or a doctorate, but I am really doing my best to be the communicator for all the great people that are doing the work and putting it together into something that makes sense and is easy to understand. Right. So th that's, kind of what I've been doing full time for seven years. And, and then, yeah, it's taken me in all different direction. It's, it's taken me into regenerative agriculture, right? It's like, okay, if we're going to be eating animals, how do we do it properly? It's taken me into 
more precisely the food lies, right? And which is sort of big food and that whole industry, which I learned a lot about. There's also big pharma and, and the sick care system, right? That's a big aspect to it too. Uh, there's big government too, like even worldwide up to the WHO and what's going on there and what is their agenda and why, why did they say in 2015 that red meat was a carcinogen and processed red meat, you know, was bad for us, stuff like that. There's, there's so much to the story when you really want to understand it all because I talked to so many people along the way. I talked to random people. I talked to doctors. I talked to Uber drivers. I talked to so many people. And if you just tell them one part of the story, they're not going to believe you or it's not going to make sense. And they're just, because they've heard so much of like, well, my doctor said that my cholesterol is high and I need to avoid red meat and I, I shouldn't eat eggs or seafood or whatever, like lobster, because it has high cholesterol. And... And then someone else would say, well, I heard that it's the number one cause of, of carbon emissions is from animal agriculture. I'm like, well, that's insane. That's not correct at all. Uh, that's like from a vegan film that, and it's completely debunked, right? So there's all these different ideas that have been put out in the mainstream. And it's really hard to, for normal people that are living their life and, you know, have their job and their family to sort through it. So I mean, hopefully by the end of this podcast, even people already know probably if they're listening uh, a lot of this stuff, but maybe they can send it to a friend and, and it'll all make sense that if you, you look at all these different pieces of the puzzle and you kind of undo the, I think a lot of it's propaganda, <laughs> undo a lot of the propaganda from the mainstream because they, they're, what I've found is really, it's a bit, these are big industries the the sick care system the the medical system and pharmaceuticals in the US it's the top 4 industries in the entire US are all in sick care they are there's 3 trillion dollar industries maybe the fourth one i think is close to a trillion as well and they're all just f medical pharmaceutical all that so there's a lot of money into keeping the status quo to keeping the systems the way they are it is the big food as well. And it's not even like conspiracy stuff, right? Like it's just, this is how the world works. The, the food system makes so much money and then it actually makes the chronic disease system and the sick care system a lot of money. And it kind of just is this revolving door of money and patients and disease management instead of fixing any of the, the problems. So, Again, I guess I'm, I'm talking to, in high level stuff right now, but if you want to drill down on any of these, uh, let's do it. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think one of the biggest realizations that I kind of have was like how incentivized it is also to like, like take a big agriculture, for example, right? Large farming operations. You know, 90, ah, I forget the exact statistics. It's well in the 90%. May, it might even be 98% of farmers can't afford to seed their field every year. And so what happens is you need a loan mm -hmm. to be able to literally plant your crops, right? <laughs> because farming is not a very profitable, <laughs> profitable endeavor, right? And I grew up around a lot of farmers. I have the utmost respect for farmers. Um, but just the way that it's structured if you want to get a loan for, you know, sowing your fields, there's a requirement to put down a certain amount of fertilizer. And like, we're just talking about MPK synthetic fertilizers here. Like, so you need to put a certain amount of fertilizer down and you need to put a certain amount of pesticides in that field as well. It's a requirement to be able to get the loan to just put seeds in your field, right? Uh, I actually took a an organic agriculture class and it was all about transitioning farms to organic agriculture. You simply are just in the hole for like five years and none of it's incentivized, right? Um, it, it, it just, there, there's no, 
there's no money in it. And that's kind of one way that I approached it was looking at it from like a business point of view too, like looking for where the money's going, where is it coming from? And that to me gave me a lot of insight. You know, when you look at it, you know, because it is a business, there's, there's Mm -hmm. no way around it. The pharmaceutical industry, it's an industry. It is a business, you know, and I do think that they're good hearted people that work for it. Uh, but j- the way that it's structured, it's structured as a business and businesses need to make money and they want to make money for ever <laughs> if they can. So, you know, again, changing the status quo and our, our understanding of health and wellness and food systems, anything like this, you know, they, they don't want that to change. And if it does change, they want to be in control of that change so that they can adapt their systems to continue to make their stuff profitable, right? Like it's simple you know, it's profit. If there's no profit, there's no money. Well, then there's no, there's nothing for them at least. Right. That's a business way of thinking. Uh, Generally, sovereignly speaking, I don't agree with that, but, um, anyways. Yeah. Well, yeah, I didn't know how it worked, but yeah, I think it was around six years ago. I talked to Gabe Brown. People may, uh, know about him. He's doing regenerative ag or like holistic management, doing, um, mixed agriculture using plants and animals no till uh you, you know using all these things in a big way he's actually in a new film common ground that i saw that hasn't kind of come out to the public yet but i i was at this, the premiere and talked to him six years ago about this and he told me about the that you could not get a loan you have to play in the system to to do it and so it was only kind of by accident and by tragedy that he got into this and he's doing it in 5,000 acres, probably more by now. So he's actually doing it in a big way. It's possible in a big way. And he told me, I mean, you can listen to my podcast with him. Uh, he, there was, uh, I think it was hailstorms. There was like year after year, his crops were ruined by hailstorms in North Dakota or something and getting ruined by, by weather. And he had to just figure it out on his own. Right, he 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 was going to go broke, and he just was like, "How am I going to do this?" So he started learning about no-till and just doing all the natural holistic methods. And eventually, you know, five, yeah, six, seven years, it started working and paying off. And so, yeah, I, I see how hard it is. People can't just do it. And th- then you're talking about the solution, right? And then, like, like, can we do this? And, and just in general, like, you know, being solution-minded. Uh, he gave me some insight on that. Is that they, people are following the money in a good way. So he told me six years ago, he couldn't tell me who, but big companies, big corporations were investing in grass-fed, grass-finished, regenerative, stuff like that, because they saw that consumers were wanting that more. So he was saying he was working with some of these big corporations and helping them, consulting with them, right? And saying, okay, let's do this. Like, this is how you do it. And you can do it in a big way and then you can make money. And so that's what's going to talk. Uh, to the, the the change is if consumers want it and then the big companies can allocate some of their resources towards that, it's going to be a slow transition, but it, it it's possible. A great point. Uh, and I mean, like one of my principles kind of as a person is, <laughs> and this is kind of timely, uh, I like this idea of voting with your dollars. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> Obviously, today, big, very timely today. Yeah, no, <laughs> very timely. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. But, you know, that's the thing. It's like if there's a if there's consumers, you know, there will be business there. So that's a really good point. Um, yeah. You know, I, I talked to I have a, a friend down in the valley there and, you know, he talks he, he has a fully closed system, a farm. It's fully closed. He doesn't have any inputs outside of his property and he doesn't do it large scale. Um, He also doesn't make any money off of it. He kind of just gives it out to sickly people in the community to try and help them heal. Mm. Very benevolent man. Like I, I really, really respect this gentleman. I mean, but he was a very, very esteemed individual prior to starting his uh, farming life, I guess you could say. Um, So he kind of supports himself financially because he's, he lost so much money getting into it. Um, and you know, now it's fully closed. It doesn't cost him a dime. Right. And it's like that small sacrifice of the money that he put into it 
small in quotations, right? Obviously not mm-hmm. everyone's able to fork out um, the price of that, but now he has a system that can quite literally go on forever and not just go on forever at the same rate. Like his soil quality is increasing every year. His organic matter is increasing every year. Like you look at the fields like regenerative agriculture and there's like way more soil than their neighbor. It just like builds up. You have to build like a new fence. Like that's like a story that I, I hear you hear every once in a while. Like it, you just build all this organic matter because you're, you're, it's all about, increasing that productivity every year right so these these systems and these principles are out there and i think that you know tying it back into our earlier conversation about like a more ancestral way of life maybe they you know maybe we were all hunter gatherers at one point maybe some people would mm-hmm. I, I i'm i don't know but at the same like you could still look at nature to see what nature does mm-hmm. right and integrate that into our modern practice of harvesting food right so like no-till you brought that one up that's a huge one permaculture right not seeding huge monocrop fields stuff like that that that's really unnatural so i think that there's a lot to be learned there as well well the ancestral principles we don't have to go all the way back so yeah so like we can like You're right. so since agriculture now we have agriculture and it's fine and we can we can do it correctly and then yes we could still look to nature and and use nature and make it work harmoniously and have this these natural cycles and natural everything there's another one uh, another documentary biggest little farm which is another good one and uh i visited john and molly there near in the la area and it's great film the guy's a cinematographer so he was collecting footage for years be- while they made this film so it's beautiful and they found out how to make it work together they had all these snails and they're they're infesting uh, the orchards and then they're like what are we going to do we're not going to use pesticides or we don't want to kill all these snails with you know chemicals or something so then they got in ducks or geese or something I, I, it's been a while since i saw it but then all the these ducks were eating all the snails they're getting tons of nutrients and they took care of the problem and so they just went through all these iterations and they figured out how to yeah have like very few inputs I don't know if they have outside inputs or not, but it, nature just works. So yeah, that's kind of the main principle I'm talking about. Back to nature, human, and so all this stuff. Sapien, really, my my broader mission is, is sapien, and that means just back to human and looking to nature for everything. And and I don't think you can cheat nature. This is what I've learned along the way. Anytime you try to cheat nature, it always goes haywire. And processed foods are the easiest example of that. So we thought that we could, well, say, go back to 12,000 years ago. We thought we could just grow a bunch of grains and, you know, settle down and things were going to be fine. And we didn't know that food is a lot more than calories. So we could support big cities eventually, right? Our populations could grow by relying on a bunch of grains, but we didn't realize that it was at the expense of nutrients. And that our diet was just lower in protein and nutrients because we were relying too much on breads and grains and all this stuff. And people got shorter. Like you can see this in the archaeological record. People got shorter. Our brains got smaller. And we had more disease. And you can see this all in the record right when we started agriculture. And then there's even times in history when there's severe malnutrition and lower lifespans and just shorter height, actually. I mean, if you look at times in history when we just relied on grains too much and these cheap kind of filler foods, people were like 5'4", like men were 5'4", on average, right? And then we got proper nutrition and our our height as a population height went up, right? So you can really tell nutrition status by your diet over time on a population level. So that's really interesting to me is, yeah, like just, yeah, learning from your environment, using the environment. Uh, learning from nature, not cheating nature. Uh, I was talking about processed foods as the ultimate example of cheating nature. So zoom ahead to, yeah, modern processed foods are terrible. So people are getting enough calories, but now where everyone's chronically sick and obese, right? So that's because when you try to cheat nature, basically take apart food and put it back together again into food-like products, People are out there, oh, you just need to count calories and that's all that matters and then you'll you'll be the correct weight and everything's fine. 
no, that's not how nature works. Our, our bodies uh, aren't just calorie machines. We need nutrients. We need protein as, you know, the main nutrient we need. And yeah, it, even the, the, the act of grinding down food into powder, right? It's in flour or even grind, like taking oils, unnatural oils, and then putting them through some 12 step process and making canola oil that is cheating nature. And it's, it has a lot of repercussions and your body sees these inputs differently. Right. And then, so there, there's a lot there and people still don't even recognize the, what the problem these are causing, right? People are still out there saying, Oh, well, all that matters is calories. And you know, it's like, well, it, you can't just look at, you can't just like have a protein bar and think that it's equivalent to say, yes, a steak that a piece of meat that we've eaten for all of history, your body if we talk about satiety, that like your body is reacting to that food differently in your gut. There's different blood sugar response. There's different proteins that we can absorb and not absorb, different minerals, vitamins. And it's a slow process that, yeah, maybe a bodybuilder can just eat protein bars and, you know, or broccoli and chicken breast and cut weight in its short term, but like long term, people can't regulate their appetite the same way, right? Or, or do something sustainably or get proper nutrition. So yeah, these are the things that I'm really interested in is like the more long-term stuff. And, you know, I want to tie back into what you were saying there earlier, right? It's like, these are not necessarily the most immediate effects either. There are immediate effects, right? When you eat, when I eat bad, I feel bad you right away. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, but if you build up like a tolerance almost to eating bad food, it doesn't really affect like when I used to like when I was in university, like first year, like I had a McDonald's three times a week mm -hmm. at more probably. And I, and if I was eating meal hall, I was eating French fries and like a bunch of crap. Like all, I, I didn't necessarily feel bad every time I ate it until I started really eating whole foods. And then now when I eat, you know, processed foods, I'm like, boom, wow, that's intense. And it's right away. And I can really feel it. But mm -hmm. um, when you build up this tolerance, you know, you can kind of almost sustain that for a long time, like our bodies do adapt to mm -hmm. what you give it, right? So if you only give it, you know, the, it will survive off of like lower quality foods. And um, this is why like someone could go vegan for 10 years, you know, they're not going to die in that 10 years but you know you might see overall a decline over time um same with the bodybuilders they might be in insane shape when they're competing um you know but then over time depends on what they do after they're competing stuff like that right it's very individual and hypothetical i guess in a way but no. um it's stuff, yeah it's just i love this stuff this is the stuff i think about the most and it you're right. Your body gets used to it. I know so many people. I was that guy. Yeah, I was 30 and I was trying to manage calories you know, my best. You know what I mean? Like I was doing the best I could. I didn't want to overeat. I didn't want to be fat, but I was just 25 pounds overweight, really, of fat and not enough muscle. And every yeah, it just happens to everyone. It happened to my parents. They weren't obese. They weren't a mess, but they were just, you You. you think you're okay. You're. You're scraping by. You're eating just like everyone else does. And then you, you, it's just a slow thing. You, I like the vegan thing too. You don't die in those 10 years. The, it, it's actually a natural adaptation that humans have is that we're able to get just enough nutrition out of all the plant foods to survive basically some crazy climate catastrophe or some hunt, you know, we couldn't hunt animals for some reason for a month. Yeah, we developed the ability to go into the fallback mode. I, I call it kind of like the fallback diet, right? It's like, yes, you, you can lose weight on vegan. That's a fallback diet. That's like your body has developed the ability to not die. But that doesn't mean you're thriving. You can lose some weight, but I mean, you're you're not getting enough nutrients. You're, you could be damaging your body long term by just getting under not enough nutrition. You could be like ruining your thyroid. There's all these problems that the, the vegans will get. So. 
yeah, it's, it's hard for people to think long term, though. Uh, humans, there's kind of this fatal flaw of being human is immediate gratification, <laughs> you know, and it's like you, it's really hard to think long term as a human. And I think f for all of history, we kind of didn't have to. And it was kind of advantageous. I think more back in the day, if you're thinking about 50,000 years ago, you didn't really have to think long term because everything around you was nutritious and healthy. You know what I mean? Like everything you 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 kind of just did things, and you needed cal. You know, you needed food, and the food you got was good, right? It was whole and real. And now, since we have modern society, and there's tons of modern convenience, now that like that that, that our brains, it's kind of to our disadvantage. So you have to fight all the urges of having the immediate gratification and having whatever you want, right? It's like it. it it's well. The bigger theory is this the mismatch. I read a book called the by Daniel Lieberman. I think it's a story of the human body or something. He's a you know good decent scientist actually. He's he's gotten some things wrong, but uh, the, like it, the mismatch diseases. I, maybe people have coined it before him. That there's just a mismatch, right? It's a mismatch between our genes, our ancient genes, and the modern environment, and that's really the the if you zoom out enough, that's the biggest problem we're facing is that we're just not set up for this modern world. So people like you and I and you know all the people doing this more intentional lifestyle or ancestral or whatever sapien type stuff, you kind of have to go out of your way to not be just a modern consumer like everyone else is. Mm. Yeah, I, this is like <laughs> this is like a what I discuss in a lot of my YouTube videos actually is like that mismatch, um, our bodies and our adaptive nature, like, especially, um, cause even like, <laughs> and it also highlights some problems in the way science is communicated in a way and even maybe conducted a little bit. Like, so when you are eating a lot of plants, say you're vegan, right? They'll look at your microbiome. You have a completely different gut microbiome than you do when you eat primarily animal products, let's say, right? Um, now, it's necessary because to extract the nutrients from plants, you need different bacteria. You know, without bacteria, there is no digestion. It's as simple as that. There's no, plants can't uptake nutrients, humans can't take in nutrients, right? It's, it's absolutely necessary. So these microbes change. Now in science, what they'll do is they'll like, they'll point to that and they'll be like, look, your micro, your microbiome is different on a vegan diet and look at your microbiome on a, you know, animal diet. Look how unhealthy that looks compared to what this looks like. Like we don't like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. it's, it's theory laden, right? We have our preconceived ideas and we're like, Oh, let's look at this evidence. Um, anyways, you could swing it either way, right? You could say, look at this. We don't know what a healthy microbiome in quotations kind of looks like, right? A priori. Um, that's kind of a difficult thing to conceive. You know, if you're going to think about it a priori, you could think, you know, let's look at the microbiome of someone who's living, you know, in an untouched tribe or something like that. That would probably be a better way to go about that. Um, yeah, you well, know, but our body, please. Well, no, I did. I, I tried. I mean, I didn't do that specifically. I didn't test our microbiome, but I did go with pe modern tribes. A few people left and I went to Tanzania yeah. and Uganda a few years ago. And they live completely differently. And of course, they have a different microbiome. But I think there's a lot of problems with the thinking. And exactly what you're saying is true. We think that you need 100 types of plant foods to be healthy. Because maybe some Dr. Uh, Herman Ponser went out there. Another guy I talked to on the phone, which I did not. Uh, have a good conversation with because he's kind of like thinks the food pyramid is that is it. He's like, we already know what health is. It's grains and plants. Uh, a lot of people are caught up in that who are of a certain age. But if, if they see the Hadza over the course of a year eating a hundred types of plants, they think that that's why they have a good microbiome. And I had a completely different interpretation of that. Not that I am a scientist or, you know, I've done better science than Herman Ponser. But uh, I just think he's caught up in the wrong paradigm and, and a bit of the, the old thinking. 
that they're out there. They caught an animal that is, we showed up and they had this small deer as a tick tick and they cut it open with a knife. It was like the, they kind of only had the only modern things they had was a knife and shorts. Uh, shorts are actually a great invention. Uh, it's really hard to like wear fashion, your own clothes out of an animal skin, right? Uh, sh shorts are really handy. So they trade for, you know, modern shorts. Every, they make their own bows. Uh, they actually trade for some of their, their arrows are metal tipped. And there's another tribe called the Zatoga that are blacksmiths and they collect random loose metal, uh, from villages. And then they know how to use a, say like a cow's stomach as bellows and heat up fire enough to melt the scrap metal and make arrowheads. And I saw them do is amazing. So they trade the arrowheads to the Hadza. <laughs> so the Hadza are out there hunting. So all they have is some, a, a modern knife, modern, some modern, semi-modern arrowheads and shorts, but everything else they just make from hand and, uh, animals and whatnot. So they're out there and they cut open this little baby deer thing and with a knife that's never been washed and they open it up on a rock that's covered in dirt and whatever. And there's dogs, they're hunting dogs. There's these wild dogs that come hunting with them and they cut it open. They give some of the guts to the dogs. They, they cut open, they cut out the liver. And so they pass, they, they cut a piece of the liver that was covered in dust and bacteria and whatever dog saliva. And it had intestines all over it. Right. So it had the animals it was green and yellow. So it, you know, this is, this is where they're getting their microbiome from. <laughs> this is what I'm saying. So I, and I ate it and they were surprised that I ate it, but I ate a piece of this raw liver and they, they shared it around to people because they know that this is this healthy thing that they should eat first. And they're not, they weren't out there like at a whole foods market, you know, they're not at some like modern grocery store. Oh, I need all, all the colors of the rainbow. I need to get my microbiome fed. No, they're out there eating animals mainly and eating off the ground and eating and having the intestines all over it and dirt and this and that, that is from, and then also just from paleoanthropologic anthropologic research and from basic critical, like just logic you know that this is what was going on is that these people are just out there eating animals and off the ground and this is why they have a good microbiome uh they and maybe over the course of the year they had to rely on random plant foods and berries just because that was around them and that's what they needed to survive but they were not healthy because they ate a hundred types of plants over the course of the year right? They were, they were healthy because they were living like humans. They were eating nose to tail. They were eating mainly animal foods really. And they got, yes, a diversity of fruits and random and honey and stuff like that. And tubers along the way, not that they're bad, right? It's nothing wrong with the fruit and honey and tubers. It's just, that wasn't the, the reason they're healthy. Yeah. You know, and I think that's interesting, right? Because this is where that theory ladenness comes in is that, you know, depend, you look at this, this tribe and what they're doing and you say, oh, well, they eat a hundred different plants a year. That's what we need. And then you ignore the rest of their lifestyle, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. um, you don't include it in your data or your paper or whatever, right? Oh, then you sit at home playing video games, watching Netflix, you're in your apartment, you're not getting sleep, you're not getting any like natural light, you're afraid of the sun, you're eating uh, grains as a base of your diet, and then you're avoiding red meat, and then never eating organ meats, never, you know, thinking eggs are going to kill you, and then think you're going to be healthy because you're going to eat 100 plant foods. It's crazy. It's crazy. It is. That probably ties into like partly your criticism with the blue zones, right? Kind of selecting what you're saying about these zones. Am I, am I kind of on the yeah. right track there? Or? I've been to some of them and my friend Mary's a medical nutritionist and has traveled to a lot of them and, and put out some content debunking them. These people are eating animal foods, nose to tail. <laughs> like they are not plant-based, but they're also doing 99 other good things. Right. Yeah. And then the blue zones, yeah, they're doing a lot of very good things. They're eating whole foods. Maybe that's number one. Like their diet, all the blue zones, they are eating whole foods. They're not eating a lot of processed foods. These are people living traditionally. So that's great. 
and they're all eating some sorts of animal foods. So again, that's great. This the guy Dan Butner, who I think is a fraudulent sort of guy that's not a scientist and just you know came with a preconceived notion of vegetarianism and made a lot of money off this and and cherry pick data and you know just came with his theory and and set out to prove his theory instead of looking at what was actually <laughs> they were actually eating and uh, yeah so they they were eating whole foods they're all including animal foods they were definitely this is what humans have always done and they're living in communities they have a sense of purpose later in life they are outside in nature they're moving they're they're constantly exercising that you know they have these old ladies gardening they're like walking up with groceries and up hills and they're doing everything they're getting to sleep they're getting sun nature everything right community and eating whole foods so it's like yes these blue zones are doing so many good things and maybe some of them happen to be more plant-based at certain periods but that's not why they were healthy uh that was just sort of uh, uh, like the nature of their environment, like in Okinawa after World War II, they they were they didn't have much meat, and they were forced to eat a lot of sweet potatoes, and they just relied on sweet potatoes because that's all they had, and they ate fish and they ate whatever they could get, right? So they weren't vegan at all; they were just happened to only have a lot of that's all they had, and so now th this is the problem with these these modern people that come and observe things and think they know what they're talking about. They, they, they're trying to, I, I saw the stupid thing on Netflix, the blue zone, you know, live to a hundred, whatever it's called. So th they're trying to like back into why, what's magical about these purple sweet potatoes that are making people live to a hundred. And it's just so frustrating. It like hurts my head. Like, do you really think there's some magical compound in, in purple sweet potatoes that makes you live to a hundred? Or is it people eating, having no money relying on completely whole foods they have no money to just buy snacks and treats and sodas and whatever they didn't even have them maybe back then and they're doing everything correct and that's why they're healthy and this is another human flaw and the, the immediate gratification type of thing is everyone's like looking for the cheat code they're like ah if we can just figure out why, what's in these purple sweet potatoes that makes people so healthy then we're going to solve this problem of of dying we're gonna be we're gonna live everyone's gonna live so much longer and it's so dumb it's so it's such like a, a human flaw thing to think of that we're gonna skip all the foundational pillars of being human and we're gonna just extract an, a compound or just eat tons of sweet potatoes that are purple and think that that's gonna make us live forever instead of doing the work you know what I mean? It's like it's like the biohackers. I, I just don't really agree with a lot of the biohacking people. They're like, oh, well, I'm going to wear gadgets and gizmos and I'm going to do all these like crazy things and I'm going to live forever. And meanwhile, I've seen them. They're just eating like French fries and, you know, they're just like they're they're obese and they just think that they can shortcut their way into good health because they ate some purple sweet potatoes. It's like a magic bullet way of thinking about life, right? You, everyone's looking for that magic bullet, the supplement or the pharmaceutical drug or the sweet potato or the the blue light blocking glasses, <laughs> you know, I was looking for that magic bullet. Well, it's, it's kind of the human nature. It's hard, but it's like, yeah. so it's like I'm, this whole sapien philosophy is, is letting people know Focus your money and your willpower. You only have a certain amount of willpower and, and focus in your day and money you know, to spend on these things. Focus it on the right things. And these are just the foundational human things. Focus, like I use all my effort and willpower and everything to just getting the basics. Eating real food, 98% of my meals. Getting outdoors and exercising, getting my sleep, just doing that. And if I have time left over and willpower left over to put on some blue blocking glasses, then great. Right? That's that's just like a bonus to me. Yeah. Awesome. Right on. Well, it might be a good time to kind of wrap things up here. Is there anything that you want to add to this episode? Anything that you might have missed or or that you want to uh, bring up? Yeah, I guess. I, I hope we haven't been too general. Like uh, to, I have this idea of like, 
how how to look at food and health that maybe can get specific and it'll start general that food is four things it's vitamins and minerals it's protein these are your building blocks right these are your nutrients and then it's energy which is fats and carbs right so it's food it's kind of like these four things it's protein vitamins and minerals and then it's fats and carbs generally it's like the first two are your nutrients your building blocks and the latter two are more of your energy sources to get you through the day and your body doesn't care the name of your diet it cares that you're getting enough nutrients to build it and enough energy to get it through the day. And for all of history, we got that by hunting and gathering around us. And it came naturally. Nowadays, it's 80, 90% of people's diets is low on nutrients and high on energy, right? So they're eating not enough protein, not enough good quality, complete protein, right? From animal sources, uh, not enough vitamins and minerals for many reasons, even the soil's depleted. If you're going to look at plants, they're a lot of depleted in vitamins and minerals as well. Uh, and they're eating too much energy from fats or carbs, right? So eating processed foods, you're screwed from the get-go. Low nutrients, high energy. All processed foods are low nutrient, high energy. And so, yeah, I'm not blaming carbs for every problem. It's it's basically empty energy, empty calories that people are eating from processed foods, from it could be fake fats, right? The seed oils, all these kind of fake fats we haven't eaten, or the just empty carbs, processed sugars, processed grains, stuff like that. So if you look at food in kind of this nutrient to energy paradigm, nutrient to energy ratio, then you're going to do a lot better. And it's not very sexy. You know, you're not going to be like a carnivore influencer and, you know, have, have like great uh, follower account because you're talking about <laughs> the nutrient to energy and so people don't want to hear about it. They just want to know what to eat. And so I guess I to, to get more specific, if you're eating whole food, if you're eating meat, eggs, fish, fruit, quality grass, raw dairy, uh, just simple things, potatoes, you can eat your sweet potato, eat your, even rice. I mean, I cook white rice and bone broth, you know, get some more nutrients back in it. If you're eating these foods, you're without having to count, really, you're going to be getting enough protein, vitamins, minerals, getting your nutrients and the right amount of energy naturally because you're eating foods in their whole form and your body knows what to do with them and it works. So that's that's kind of my thing is I don't think about even like my per meal or per day. I'm thinking like on a month level almost. It's like, am I, and, and I, well, it actually boils down to per meal because, you, you know, it's like per meal, I'm getting sure. high nutrients and the correct amount of energy. And over the course of the month, I've done that. But also if I'm at a party and I have some ice cream, I'm not sad or mad or stressed out about it because over the course of my month, that's perfectly fine on my nutrient to energy scale. That makes sense, right? I mean, I'm, I don't I don't go out and just eat French fries because I'd rather just not eat, you know, these highly fried seed oils that could be uh, in the fryer for weeks at a time or whatever, right? So I'm not trying to do that, but a little ice cream doesn't scare me. So basically eat, a delicious diet of delicious foods that most people like, and you're pretty good. Yeah, agreed. I think my conclusion for the episode uh, for the YouTube community guideline people is that we should eat seed oils and beyond meat and that cows are killing the planet <laughs> uh, just because I did get a strike recently. So uh, just to clear things up, eh, we do advocate for oh, definitely. a full plant-based diet here. Um, <laughs> no, no, but in all seriousness, that's, that's great. Yeah. Whole foods. I like the way you put it with the uh, energy ratio, um, nutrient energy ratio. It's a good way to think about it. It's a good way to kind of rationalize it. I like it a lot. Uh, where can the listeners learn more from you? Uh, yeah, food lies. Uh, I have the food lies YouTube channel. I've got food lies, Instagram food lies on X food lies everywhere. Peak human podcast, uh, nose to tail. That's actually my company's name. 
I believe in eating nose to tail. And yeah, you can go to nose tail.org. Got some great stuff, beef tallow, body care. You know, we have dried meat, just some good products that uh, I believe in. And uh, yeah, that's just, that's where you can find me. Awesome, brother. Really appreciate your time. This has been a fantastic episode. All right. Thanks, man. Definitely. I want to thank you all for listening. This is not medical advice or nutritional advice for your informational purposes only. Also remember that we're all responsible sovereign beings capable of thinking, criticizing, understanding absolutely anything. We the people in the greater forest are together, self-healer, self-governable, self-teachers, and so much more. Please reach out if you have any questions, criticisms, comments, concerns, whatever it may be, in order to find me on Instagram. Love chatting with you guys. Want to hear your thoughts on the episode, so make sure you reach out and let me know what you think. If you enjoyed it, found it informative, give us a like, comment, share, subscribe, follow, review, whatever you got to do on the platform you're on. It's much appreciated. Sharing is always the best way, guys, so share it with a friend, family member, crazy uncle, something like that. It'd be much appreciated. Just remember, there are two types of people in the world. Those who believe they can, those who believe they can't. And of course, they're both correct, guys. Thanks for listening. Take care.